So thanks everybody for coming today, uh, being here this afternoon. So we're going to talk about uh, cloud native security patterns. So cloud native systems are generally built as containerized uh, microservices that we run on systems like Kubernetes, Mesos, um, and other orchestration and distributed management tools. Um, compared to monolithic services, uh, we kind of distribute the problem. We have to approach security in different ways. Uh, we can inject security uh, in ways that we can in a monolithic type of architecture. And with cloud native systems, there's a lot of opportunities, but there's also a lot of ways we can kind of go wrong. Uh, so today we're going to look at some of the common patterns that are implemented in cloud native systems uh, and some of the programmatic patterns and, and higher level tools that you can use as well uh, to secure infrastructure. Uh, so we're going to focus on some of those patterns. Um, I'll talk more today about Kubernetes, uh, Docker, and AWS just because um, I work with those on a regular basis more than others, um, but I'll throw some GCP references in there as well. Um, and we're going to look at things like uh, how to implement secure multi-tenancy. Uh, so lots of times we see uh, application teams providing um, a multi-tenant environment, uh, which is very different than if you're running a monolithic application and say a single virtual machine. Uh, so we're going to take a look at how do we actually lift the stacks we have now into a cloud native world. Uh, so about myself, uh, CEO at Invisium, I've uh, been doing that for a couple years now. Um, New Yorker trapped inside the DC Beltway. Uh, I actually learned how to drive in New York, which means I learned how to use things like my horn and turn signals. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody else in America. Um, and I'm not a big DC, uh, Texas sports team. Any, any, any uh, Cowboys fans in here or anything like that? Did you watch the Redskins game last week? Because it was one of the few times I was actually cheering for, for the Cowboys in my life. And they failed. That, that, was, that was bad. Um, yeah, so uh, I do a bit of development in Go and Scala. Um, some days my job is spreadsheets and meetings, but I, I usually try to find ways to get into a code editor uh, throughout the day. So cloud native systems. Um, generally, we're running uh, containers, right? So we're not often running big virtual machines. Uh, we take advantage of modern architecture that allows us to do things like scale horizontally, um, build resilient systems that do self-healing. Um, and to do that, we want to be able to scale kind of horizontally, be able to launch containers at will, kill them, and so on and so forth. So containers are a good way to deploy systems in a cloud-native world. Uh, we're generally build, building things as microservices, so we're not often building monoliths, but that's not to say that we can't build monolithic applications on a cloud-native stack. It's just not kind of done as much. Or you'll see it where people are decomposing a monolith and they'll do it you know, one piece at a time. So you may see kind of that, where you will run some kind of monolithic stack. Uh, but generally, you have some sort of polyglot type of data persistence. Uh, you don't generally have like a single, you know, MySQL, right? One service may want to use something like Cassandra. Um, another service wants to use DynamoDB. And so uh, generally, you deal with a lot of different data stores, and your data goes in a lot of different directions. Uh, so you have to think about the life cycle of those things, access, so on and so forth. Uh, with regards to just dynamically um, orchestrated systems, so we're going to run things on something like Kubernetes. We're not going to run containers with like a shell script and a loop, right? So uh, these systems are heavy duty. They handle things like uh, resiliency, different deployment strategies, um, scheduling, um, and a lot of hard things that you wouldn't be able to kind of manage on your own. Um, compared to you know, the way we built software before, things are very declarative. Uh, so we have things like YAML files, and we have you know, infrastructure's code, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so things are declarative, and we expect that uh, there's going to be automation um, from end to end, right? So not necessarily putting humans in the mix as much, um, but at the same time, our, our architectures describe themselves. Uh, we want to have the ability to get uh, data and telemetry from events, uh, so a lot of different things happen, uh, and we want to be able to respond to those things accordingly. Things like circuit breaking, uh, when we know, for example, a service has gone down and we need to kind of fail over, um, and we can implement things like circuit breaking you know, with these platforms as well as in our applications. Uh, and things like resiliency are extremely important, right? So you shouldn't really be planning for your systems to never fail. Uh, you should embrace things like failure. You should expect failure to happen. You should anticipate the ways failure is going to happen. Uh, and building on a cloud native infrastructure um, definitely makes you think about resiliency, uh, but gives you a lot of different strategies for how you can also uh, be resilient. And whose job is it anyway? Uh, what you generally see is a couple different kind of models than what I've seen. Uh, you'll have platform teams, so bigger shops that are going to do multi-tenancy where they're pretty much moving their entire stack um, onto something like Kubernetes. Uh, they're generally going to have a platform team uh, that's going to handle um, some things, including like you know, the control plane, setting up the infrastructure, um, basic things like RBAC and authentication. And then those things become self-service by the teams, right? 
big kind of theme is everything that needs to be self-service. Um, so we can delegate rights um, down to teams, right? And we can give them uh, segregated kind of environments where they can run prod environments, they can run dev environments. Um, but we want to definitely try to enforce multi-tenancy. Uh, that definitely goes wrong, I've seen a lot of times, right? So uh, depending on the cross-cutting concerns and who's handling what, um, especially as people migrate to kind of, you know, modern architecture from the way they've been doing things, something always falls through the cracks and what you end up finding is that uh, somebody didn't do something somewhere, whether that was something you should have put in a Docker file, uh, something you should have configured, you know, at the control plane level that should have never happened, um, or something you could have configured like at a pod specification, right? So uh, multiple layers and different people handling things. And uh, isolating containerized workloads. So uh, this is an example of Kubernetes um, and its control plane. Uh, but these uh, concepts are the same, mostly in cloud native. So for starters, we're generally doing most um, control and operations things over the network. Uh, and more often than not, we're using REST APIs to do that. Uh, there's also things like gRPC, and we can work with uh, RPC as well. Uh, but generally, when it comes to things like Mesos Marathon or Kubernetes, we're exposing most things over an API, which allows you to spin up containers, kill containers, run commands in other containers, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the API is definitely a juicy place to attack. You generally have some type of uh, persistent data store for, for a cluster to represent its state. So in Kubernetes, they use etcd as a key value store. Uh, and etcd definitely has some security issues um, if you don't configure it out of the gate. More often than not, uh, more of the deployment tools nowadays, um, they, they do build some security opinionations in there, not exposing it on all interfaces, um, ensuring that there's mutual TLS to authenticate between peers and the, um, as well as the API. Uh, but there are some deployment tools and script I've seen out there that just kind of strip these things down. And I've seen teams just kind of pull these things wildly and you know, they end up having um, a key value store exposed in their network that pretty much controls the cluster state. And you can just basically connect to that without authentication, right? And that's something you can do really easily. Uh, so anything programmatic you do at that point is moot because you're just pretty much game over at that point. An interesting thing is that uh, we implement controllers to do a lot of things, uh, to manage different resources, uh, to be able to react and do different things within the cluster. Uh, so the controller uh, manager uh, works with the scheduler to figure out where to essentially end up uh, deploying these resources within our cluster. So our containers actually run somewhere down there at the end of the day. So at the top is our control plane. Um, and these, you know, whether it's uh, Docker Swarm, Mesos, uh, Kubernetes, you're generally working with some sort of control plane. Uh, and then we dig down to the container level. So uh, we have a lot of different things to consider here. Uh, we want to keep you in the container, right? So especially in a multi-tenant environment uh, where you can essentially jump out. If you can get out of that container and you can get onto that host, um, you can pretty much attack anything. So we want to think about, can you attack other containers? Um, are there things like network ports exposed, right? So we can expose a container as a service. And then even if we have it in a namespace, uh, all containers can pretty much hit it because it's just an IP table is ruled open at that point. Uh, so at that point, we don't really get great network segmentation and containers by default don't generally have strong egress. Um, they have better ingress. So we want to think about how do we keep you in the container and you know, one thing is obviously egress rules getting out of containers. Um, we definitely don't want you to be able to attack different components. So the kubelet, for example, in Kubernetes has had some issues over the years. Um, essentially, if you can attack the kubelet, then you can try to, you know, attack things upstream, uh, manipulate other uh, containers that are running on that node, so on and so forth. So uh, you definitely want to keep those things safe. Uh, and you most certainly want to limit what you can do with the API server. So the API server is kind of uh, the kind of gateway to everything else, right? So if you can impersonate or elevate privileges at the API, you can do a lot of things, right? So you want to make sure that you're giving containers minimal privileges out of the gate, so you don't want things running as root. You want to limit containers uh, sharing the same accounts uh, because you break down a lot of walls at that point. So as we mentioned, the control plane uh, and core components, this does pretty much all the brains and, and work of the, of, of the cluster. Uh, and if we get access to it and we can compromise it, then we can pretty much take things over. So um, I've seen people do a really good job at isolating network access to the control plane. Um, I've seen, you know, environments where people could talk to control plane from printers and, uh, you know, guess Wi-Fi network. So kind of pick your poison at that point. Uh, but the, one of the nice things that if you are using one of the managed services, um, generally they're abstracting away a lot of the control plane stuff for you, which means they're hardening it for you, they're updating it for you. And um, they're restricting some level of access to what you can actually do there. So um, if you're using a managed service, then you kind of do things a little bit differently. 
Uh, one of the core things, though, is uh, working with uh, the reconcilement pattern. So basically what ends up happening is that we always want to move our cluster towards a desired state. So as our configurations are declarative, and we can say this is what we want our cluster to look like, right? So we want, when this container is deployed, we want it to be running with you know, these attributes, annotations, and settings at runtime. Um, and if something changes in the specification, then we want that, run, that, that, that environment to match that almost instantly, right? Um, so that's kind of the concept. So if we make a change and we change something in a container's deployment in the pod specification, it's going to immediately respawn that um, in some cases. Obviously, if we've you know, met all of our security uh, constraints and stuff like that. But uh, this is a pattern that's core to kind of how Kubernetes works. Um, and we can obviously use that for security purposes, right? Um, you know, quick patching, so we're not thinking about these long life cycles of containers. Um, assuming we're you know, working um, with a fairly stateless container where we don't need to think about, you know, so if we're running databases, then we have to think about state. If we're running things like message queues, then we really need to think about state. Um, if we're running a really thin MDC app that's not doing things like uh, caching and stuff like that, then, then, we, then we can be a little bit more uh, flexible with killing those things, right? So um, if we adopt this pattern here, then we can use that for security and compared to how long it may take in some environments to actually push changes and a maintenance window, right? We could do things um, at the speed of light. And with Kubernetes, we could also do different deployment strategies, blue, green, AV, and stuff like that. So depending on how you deploy applications, you can tie those practices into kind of these core patterns that are provided for you out of the box. Um, so basically something I should kind of throw on you guys is containers aren't really great um, sandboxes, as if that kind of wasn't clear from the first couple slides. So as we talked about, we share host resources. Um, and basically, if we overprivilege our containers, then we, that translates to we're overprivileging them uh, in some cases on the host itself, right? So root inside of the container has the ability to access root namespaces, um, control groups, and things like that on the host. So if we aren't careful, um, we share too much, right? Because uh, Docker, uh, Rocket, LXC, similar container technologies for Linux like that, they rely on standard Linux facilities like control groups and namespaces, right? Which have been prone to implementation issues over the years. Uh, and what we end up doing is relying on things like seccom quite a bit to limit the syscalls that we can access. So Docker has a default seccom profile that blocks a bit. Um, but then, you know, I know many people that also run containers that don't actually implement seccom, which means you get none of those inherent controls. Uh, so when we rely too much on rule-based uh, control, uh, security controls, we shoot ourselves in the foot. And here's an example. Um, if you don't believe me, container escapes happen. Um, virtual machine escapes have happened a lot over the years as well, right? We shouldn't not use these technologies, but we should understand, you know, in our threat models that these are realistic threats, right? That these things are going to happen at some point, um, potentially. Uh, but essentially, if you look at most of the kind of the, prof the, the characteristics of container escapes, you find that either um, there was an object that wasn't properly namespaced, uh, the containers had, you know, more capabilities and they weren't dropped. Um, you had the ability to manipulate the container's um, identifiers somewhere through the container uh, spin-up lifecycle to assume greater privileges, um, somewhere between building and running. Uh, and generally, these things kind of go back to the same kind of core issues. Um, but we should understand that certainly it's, it's definitely possible to get out of a container. So here's our gateway drug. Here's a Docker file. Right? Here is a container image that we're extending from uh, Golang 10, uh, 1, 10, 2. Uh, there's me, the maintainer. Um, we can set user, but we can also, at the container orchestration level, um, shoot those things down as well. Uh, we have some commands we'll run, and then we have some code that we move over. Uh, what ends up happening there in reality is that there's actually a fat daemon running on the host uh, that's spawning those containers. So in the way Kubernetes works, it interacts with the kubelet. Uh, when we looked at it right here, um, which is right above the container runtime. So essentially, the kubelet uh, is being told by the schedule that it should run things and then it runs things. That's maybe the easiest explanation for that. Um, so it's a fairly dumb process in that regard. Um, but basically that daemon is what's managing that. So if you can pretty much control the daemon, then you can control um, the containers on that host as well, right? Um, and you can assume some of those privileges. So you can move laterally and in some cases, uh, potentially elevate privileges inside, the, uh, inside of the cluster, depending on service accounts that are being tied to those containers and whatnot. And we have different ways we can isolate our containers. Um, the traditional way with, uh, and so, by the way, I'm not talking much about Windows because I don't do much with Windows. Um, but if you're doing things on Windows, the TLDR is you can use Hyper-V um, and you at least get basically like the hypervisor level of things. Uh, 
But in, in a Linux world, we can work with uh, C groups and namespaces, but we know there's a lot of implementation issues, ways to jump out of there. Uh, cool project that I've kind of been following, playing around with is Gvisor out of Google. Um, they've implemented a lot of kernel stuff in user space land, uh, and including uh, a lot of the Linux syscalls, but not all of them. Uh, and so pretty much you have that, uh, essentially one, limiting the privileges you can assume on that host, um, but also giving you a limited set of syscalls and things like that. Um, so it definitely provides a better uh, isolation model in my opinion, but it's definitely a, a young technology. And you can go back to the hypervisor and, and virtual machine ways, way, uh, virtual machine way based to doing things. Uh, Kata containers, and Intel, which is based on Intel's clerk containers, uh, uses Cumium Lite, and you essentially run Docker inside of a small uh, stripped down virtual machine. Uh, so it gives you that, obviously, uh, wrapper you get around a hypervisor and a little bit more. Uh, but also you have the performance and resource utilization of running a hypervisor around your containers. So you also have to consider that as well. Not everything uh, is free in this world. And in terms of how the container runtime stack up, um, you find that Docker kind of gets most things right compared to some of the others. Um, they have strong defaults for things like SecComp and AppArmor um, and, and capabilities and things like that, but uh, you can turn those off just as easily. Um, and I can't stress that enough. Like I, I, I like the things that the container runtimes give you, but I, I see more often than not, people don't get the full benefit of those things. So um, when you're managing your base containers, make sure that you're first and foremost using containers that actually do have support for AppArmor, SecComp, SE Linux, um, if you want to use those things, right? So just because you're pushing them from Kubernetes saying like, you know, thou shall run SecComp, if it's not supported inside of the container, then it's not actually going to give you any of those benefits, right? Um, so you do want to make sure that you're using images that support those things. Uh, something I see people do a lot where they lose control is use like image latest tags, right? Instead of actually um, pinning to actual specific uh, versions. So that's one thing that you should definitely consider um, is always using tag versions. And um, if you're using things like, um, you know, Docker Trust, uh, Google's binary authorization, then you can also do some level of uh, attestation and, and trust and signing of those um, to ensure that you're only running trusted images. But that's maybe... Uh, another slide if I had it. I don't have it in here. Um, so SecComp, for anyone that's not familiar with SecComp, and, and these are things, by the way, that traditionally, like, we haven't talked to our, like, Java developers about things like SecComp and, and syscalls, right, and how to, can, um, how to run SE Linux properly and constrain things. Um, and honestly, you can kind of keep some of these details out of your developers' hands. My take. Um, but SecComp allows you to basically limit and filter a bunch of syscalls. Um, which basically translates to things that aren't uh, gated by dropping capabilities. Um, you can also block with syscalls. So if you were to say, for example, do uh, capability dropping in conjunction with um, seccomp and syscall filtering, then you can get a little bit more granular um, for kind of attack surface reduction. And Docker, again, has a good profile, but you have to have support. Um, and if you do have support, then by default, Docker will run with that profile for you. So if you support it, it's like a quick win, and your developers don't have to do anything to get the benefits of it. Uh, with regards to AppArmor, so there's also uh, a policy for that as well that Docker runs. Uh, AppArmor gives you the ability to do a little bit more, so you can work with things like capabilities, but you can also um, deny more granular access to resources like files. Um, but again, uh, within AppArmor, there's also a strong Docker default, and other container runtimes do have good ones as well. Capabilities are an interesting one um, because we generally overprivilege our containers like crazy, right? So. Who thinks like their Tomcat container, who thinks Tomcat needs to run with root? Anybody? Okay, cool, you all have jobs still. Um, but I've seen this like time and time again, right? And you kind of shoot people down, it's like, so you either blame yourself for giving people the ability to deploy that way or blame them. But honestly, I would blame you for allowing them to do that um, because you have quite the capabilities and things like uh, Kubernetes, for example, um, Docker has the ability to drop these things as well. Um, and you can manage them with Swarm. So, uh, more often than not, this is a, just a lack of understanding more than anything. Um, and again, Docker does drop these down significantly. Um, and by default, you're going to get these. What you don't always get is seccomp if you don't have support for that. So if you don't have seccomp, at the very least, you do get gating of some of these things. If you actually drill into the syscalls, um, you find that you know, some things kind of bubble up to um, things like capsis admin. Um, and, and, and other capabilities that um, are subset that the syscalls end up being a subset of, right? Um, so depending on, you either have a lot of security or um, just enough. And uh, with regards to privileges, right? So here's an example of dropping a bunch of capabilities, and this is what you need to run pings, like the ability to use raw sockets, right? 
Um, and you can essentially drop all the capabilities and still run this and do exactly what you need to do in that container, but nothing else, right? Um, and that's good, because honestly, we want to limit what our containers can do. The problem with maintaining some of these things is that, uh, one, our applications change. Um, two, we, we need to profile our applications to figure these things out. So there are um, tools, for example, um, if you Google like App Armor and Learning, uh, there's different things built in, App Armor tooling, uh, to basically look at a set of pro uh, processes and build App Armor profiles for them. So it looks at which capabilities it uses, um, which files it accesses, so on and so forth. And you can build automated profiles. They wouldn't be as tight as if you built them by hand, but they're better than nothing, right? Because not everyone in your organization is an App Armor expert. Um, not everyone in your organization understands you know, the nitty gritty about privileges and capabilities. Uh, something we could do is um, work with user namespaces um, in Linux. So this is something that modern kernels support. And um, Docker supported for a little bit, but you haven't had upstream support in the, the orchestration platforms for a bit. Um, so basically, if we enable um, the feature gate in Kubernetes there, experimental host user namespace defaulting gate, um, that essentially allows us to end up doing um, user space uh, remapping of things. What does that translate to? is the fact that instead of running with an actual user ID that has relevance on the system in any way, we're running with like a really high UID user that's not gonna have like any privileges on that system. So best, worst case scenario is if you can basically get uh, an impersonation of that user and do things on the system, you're gonna be restricted by what they can do in terms of discretionary and mandatory access controls. So um, it gives them the ability to at least kind of nip that coming out of the container. A uh, newer thing that's kind of getting better support, but it's not something that's well supported everywhere, is rootless containers. Um, and basically, we want to run containers that essentially can't run root. Um, run C and some other ones do have some support, uh, but what's been limited, so if you look, for example, on like GitHub and look for like rootless, like Kubernetes, rootless Docker, like you'll find a million open issues that people have been working on for years, and um, new ones that pop up, right? It's, it's really hard. Um, because you have to think about what happens in the container, you know, has to be replicated on that host. And then within a cluster, you also need to replicate that um, between nodes, right? So it's fairly complicated when you think about what happens at the container and then the runtime and then basically in the distributed manner, right? So it's fairly complicated. Um, Kubernetes has some support in um, 112 um, in, within the process mount security context attribute. Um, if you flip that, um, you do have the ability to work with some of the rootless container stuff, but um, yeah, use it your own kind of discretion because it's, it's, it's fairly new. And uh, if you notice and you've been working with Kubernetes for a while, you see things like experimental and alpha and beta kind of thrown around like just anything. So um, yeah, take that with a grain of salt. No new privileges. So this is one that's been uh, supported in kernel for a while, but it limits the ability to, for essentially for a process to assume new privileges. Um, so you can break, you know, the ability to elevate with like set UID and set root ID binaries. So basically the idea there is that if you were to run a binary which had like the set, um, you would flag for root uh, set on that, you would essentially run still as your effective user ID. So you wouldn't assume root privileges. Um, and you can break a lot of attacks like that, right? So a lot of times you find, um, you know, people leave. I mean, this is, if you're an attacker that's on, you know, Linux box, that's one of the first things you look for, right? Can I find binaries that allow me to elevate privileges? Um, so you can limit essentially the ability for an attacker that gets onto your container, you know, SQL injection is going to happen, some kind of RCE bug is going to happen. Like in my world, I assume somebody's going to get into that container and, and own your application, right? It's what do I do from there and what do I limit you doing within the cluster that matters at that point. Uh, and if I could restrict your ability to basically assume privilege another way, great, right? Take that off. Authentication, right? So we've talked a little bit now about what happens at the container level and um, it's very important to keep you inside of the container. Uh, but it's not always possible, unfortunately, right? Um, because the containers uh, have um, the ability to interact with the cluster, so on and so forth. So um, not always feasible to keep you really constrained um, because there's things you're still only going to need to do in, in, in a real world. Um, but we need to do strong authentication. So our applications, our containers, they authenticate themselves to the cluster to do different things. Um, we also have users and developers, right? So we're going to give people access to deploy things, to manage the cluster. So we're going to give them access which translates to API access. Um, but essentially, each service we run ends up getting its own service account. Uh, so it runs with its own UID essentially at that point. And that actually gets a, a, a token mounted within that um, container's Etsy that allows it to basically authenticate to the cluster using that as a bearer token, right? So 
sometimes we have to think about the kind of authentication and how we're sharing credentials between containers. Um, so if we're not setting explicit accounts, then they're defaulting to like a default account, right? So it's definitely part of a, 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 an, a, an account management strategy. So yeah, in each namespace, by default, you get dropped into, um, so when you create a new namespace, uh, there's a default account. If you create a new application and launch a pod without you know, setting a specific account, it defaults to default. And if you create a new one, then it defaults to default, right? And so now you have this problem where you have you know, dozens of applications that can suddenly call API on behalf of each other, pull down things like secrets, crypto keys, I mean, all the stuff that you'd essentially want to have, you know, some separation um, between, right? So when, even though we're, we're, we're doing things the right way, we're using secrets management, um, we end up having implementation uh, flaws that end up just kind of undermining that whole structure. And even if we're blocking ingress, uh, for example, network access to a container, um, we can still attack them through the API, for example, right? So if we're sharing things like credentials, um, there's different uh, endpoints that we can use um, to essentially uh, send commands. So from one um, container from another, uh, without network access, we can do that, right? So we didn't have network access in, but we had API access. And um, on that actual kubelet, there's uh, a couple different services that are running. One of those is to receive things like commands and route them to the appropriate container. Uh, so that's something like as a developer or even like a cluster administrator, like you can't shut up. That's just behavior, right? So if we, again, don't do privileges right, then we open ourselves up to that attack as well. So we certainly want to make sure that we're doing that. So we always want to create a unique service account per pod. Uh, and that's the command right there in Kubernetes land. Create service account, S1. You specify the namespace because any service account does need to be namespace. So those aren't like a cluster level resource. And uh, you create that within a namespace and you create your pod, um, I don't know how well you can see that in the back, so let me just pull that up uh, in the wrong direction, almost. There we go, hope you can see that a little bit better, but uh, essentially at that point, we're just specifying that's the actual service count we wanna use, and when that actually happens, it's gonna get its own service count token uh, that's gonna be unique, um, and it's not gonna be able to impersonate other accounts. Um, now, if you've given that service account, for example, like cluster admin privileges, well, that's your own fault, right? Um, by default, it's gonna get access. Once you've turned on things like role-based access control, um, it's gonna be restricted uh, quite a bit, right? So RBAC is one of those things that's cumulative, right? You can add but not take away the way it works. And we don't wanna share things from the host. Um, so this is another way you can poke holes in things, you can share uh, mounts, you can share, you know, access to, to be able to uh, talk to different network paths, IPC pipes. Uh, so generally you want to avoid sharing any of those things at all costs. And one of the things we can do inside of uh, a pod security policy is actually set some of those. And mm, off the screen again. Uh, and I'll just, if you can see, I know you can't, um, but basically there we can set things like host network false, host IPC false, host uh, PID false, and basically at that point we're saying um, within a policy that we're going to um, apply when containers are admitted to our cluster, we're saying that you actually can't assume any of those things, right? So um, this is one of those things that you play whack-a-mole if you kind of try to do it on every container you launch. So I, as a preference, I'd rather do this in kind of a centralized manner. Um, so those are generally things you'd want to kind of adopt policies for. Now in reality, you run most cases multiple policies to do that, right? Because you have different containers they're gonna to need to run with different levels of privileges. So does anybody run um, any of the commercial kind of container security tools uh, that, that force you to run things like Capsys Admin and Ptrace uh, and other really, really privileged things? Um, so I've actually seen groups that have implemented multiple pod security policies. Uh, and you can, if you don't do those correctly, uh, overcast those where potentially containers you wouldn't want to be get, getting those privileges would. So um, definitely a thing to consider. Authorization, so we've authenticated you, we know who you are, um, whether that's your account to imp uh, authenticate to the API, um, whether that's the, the service account that you're using to do things, we know who you are. So once we know who you are, we have to figure out and tell you what you can actually do. Um, so when we think about subjects, we have you know, generally users, we have service accounts, um, and then we have groups that we can put them in. 
And um, it's important to understand what they can actually do. So Kubernetes uh, pre-role-based access control, and if people weren't using like attribute-based access control, uh, was a real shit show, right? So pretty much you can do anything you want, right? Um, and it was really hard to limit what people could do. Uh, so RBAC came along and um, it's there, right? So a lot of uh, implementations turn it on by default. So if you build, for example, with like cube admin, then it's like it has RBAC emission control turned on, or uh, authorization mode, sorry. Um, and it allows us essentially to limit what you know, individual users and services can do. We can do things at a cluster level, right? And sometimes I see people just get lazy and they're like, well, screw it, I give everybody cluster level access and stuff. And in reality, we, at that point, have already kind of shot ourselves, right? Because we have namespaces and we have you know, other layers that we can do some segmentation at. So the best thing we get there is some control of blast radius. So imagine we have, say, you know, 20 applications running on this multi-tenant kind of infrastructure, right? Or 20 different you know, systems running in their own namespaces. Uh, and if we're granting people only permissions at the um, namespace level, the worst case scenario, one of those accounts gets compromised or you know, somebody gets their service account token and they're only gonna get the ability to do things potentially inside that namespace, right? So we've limited um, the blast to our other applications in that multi-tenant environment. Uh, what you end up seeing a lot of times is people will grant things um, cluster-wide. Uh, so the first couple people that need to do any kind of like, you know, ops type of stuff or set systems up, right? They get cluster admin, no questions asked. Um, they get like SSH into like a master node and all these things they shouldn't get. Um, but this is one of those places you generally want to start as low as possible, like anything, you know, authorization or role-based access control. Um, because you can overdo it and you can give people the ability to pull secrets, um, control services that they'd have no other business doing. And it's fairly easy. Uh, so everything is going to be some kind of YAML file or you can even use JSON if you like that. Uh, but basically on the left-hand side, we create a role. So we create a role in the production namespace, and we say that role has the ability to access one API group there, which in Kubernetes, if it's blank, that's the core API group. So that has you know, all the primitives like containers, pods, secrets, and the things that have been around for quite some time. Uh, and we're giving it the ability to only do uh, essentially read-only type things, right? So get, watch, and list. Uh, we're not giving it the ability to do delete. We're not giving it the ability to do patch, put, and stuff like that. We're giving it only the ability to read things at that point. Uh, on the right hand side is where we actually bind it. So if you create a role, it has no bearing because it's not actually applied to a, uh, a subject. So on the right hand side, we're applying that to a service account and um, within the production namespace. So again, if you recall, service accounts are always a namespace thing. And we're given that service account only the ability to do those things inside of that one specific namespace. So uh, if that service account was to be compromised, then, I mean, obviously that's production in that example, right? You're, you're probably hosed anyway. Um, but, you know, at the very least, it would be production of one application or system, and it wouldn't be basically the whole environment at that point. Uh, so pretty powerful. Um, so within Kubernetes, uh, everything works as uh, a controller. And uh, this is something that's a kind of a cognitive core pattern there. So we end up creating controllers for different things, and then those controllers will watch what's happening, and those controllers um, we'll do things uh, very focused on a specific type of resource, right? So in Kubernetes, you have a controller that handles uh, secrets, deployments, uh, and all the different types of uh, resources and workloads. Uh, they're very specific, right? And they understand the behavior of those particular um, objects better. Um, and what they essentially allow you to do, though, is in Kubernetes, it allows you to read the object specification and uh, mutate its status or do things like enforce security controls. Um, and an example of that is uh, the emission controller. So uh, what it ends up allowing you to do at the time of emission is check what the container is set with um, with regards to security settings. So is it running as root? Uh, you can set things and force it to use a specific set comp profile. Um, you can ensure that uh, you can't uh, elevate privileges. Uh, there are things that if you were trying to manage these uh, on, a, on an application by application basis, you'd fail. Uh, because things move way too quickly and you're a human and surprise you get in the way at this point, right? Um, so these are things, honestly, in terms of a control that you must, you're must much better off using a controller to do that. Um, and the controller essentially is going to pretty much get hit every time you're trying to emit a, a pod to the, the cluster. And it's going to check the pod's specification, determine if it uh, is secure, and it's either going to mutate some things or it's going to reject it from getting emitted to the cluster, which is pretty cool. Um, PSP is one of those things you generally turn on in most distributions. 
Um, and interesting thing, kind of some rules that I've seen people confuse themselves with. So you can have more than one pod security policy. Uh, first off, it's going to take uh, the ones that aren't going to mutate things. Um, if not, uh, then it's going to go alphabetically, right? So if they're kind of similar, then it's going to go in alphabetical order. And um, if it's a pod update, um, uh, it's going to reject things if you actually have to mutate it, right? So new pod, sure, but a pod update, then it's, it's going to work differently. And these are the primary things you can control um, using a controller, for example, pattern and, and enforcing some of these controls. You can do things like set the rule-based execution security. Um, you can restrict the namespace it can operate within. Um, you can restrict, for example, the volumes that they can work with. Um, things like secrets you generally want to give, right, um, because applications going to need those. Um, persistent volumes and stuff like that, but you, you can limit, for example, what they can actually assume. Um, but the downside there is that if you over kind of cast the net here, then you break things and, and everybody hates security and security doesn't work anymore, right? And, and our lives continue to suck. Uh, the other thing that you have to do, so you can create a PSP and it's like, woohoo, I did all this. And then it's not actually going to work because it uses role-based access control to determine uh, which pods and containers can actually pull that. Um, so uh, containers going to look... Uh, so basic just there is that um, if you haven't applied the RBAC to it, then um, it's not actually going to apply that admission to your containers. Because it's going to be looking to apply it um, based on things like the, the subjects, um, the users and the groups that are, that are within it. Uh, so another interesting thing we get to work with is sidecars. Um, so sidecars are a cool pattern. Uh, has anybody worked with things like Envoy, Istio in their environment? Has anybody heard of Envoy? It's a Lyft project. It's cool. No? Okay. Uh, so sidecar essentially allows us to de decompose things. It allows us to extend what a container can do without actually modifying the container itself. So we generally deploy a sidecar um, with a container, um, which ends up meaning that we also, if we want these things to scale, need a way to actually inject these things automatically. So if we launch a new container, we want it to have a sidecar, right? So in the sidecar, we can do things like mutual TLS, so we don't have to worry about our, our container handling those things. Um, we could do authentication and authorization between services to determine which microservices essentially can call out over the network to other ones. Uh, we can offload things like logging. We can do that in the sidecar. Um, and we can do things if we have these kind of deployed. Uh, and we can do things like distributed tracing and have the ability to understand what's happening between our services. Generally, we spend a lot of time and money giving ourselves monitoring abilities and kind of ingress and egress points. And we don't really understand what happens in between. So when we deploy things like sidecars, we get another way to get a lot of intelligence out of our containers. But it requires some way to manage these uh, and get you know, a derived data and context from them if we want them to be valuable. Uh, the ambassador pattern is kind of similar. So we work with like an out-of-process pro out proxy. Uh, so we can either have, you know, for example, an ambassador per container, uh, or we can have you know, a daemon that our containers kind of sit behind as a proxy, right? So we can have them sit behind um, HA proxy, something like that. Um, but it's another way that we can also, if we want to update legacy applications and kind of make them cloud native, then we can uh, do things like proxies and ambassadors to, 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 to kind of phase them in, right? So when I talked about how people do different strategies when they phase out a monolith and they decompose it, um, see all kinds of strategies. And sometimes one of the answer um, is putting a proxy in front of things, right? And uh, just kind of hiding certain behaviors and having that translation layer. So service mesh is where it actually gets um, useful. Uh, and so I don't know if anyone's actually heard of Envoy. If not, definitely take a look at it. Um, consoles, uh, HashiCorp implementation of something similar. Uh, but essentially, it allows us to actually manage the sidecars, right? So we have a sidecar essentially deployed with each one of our containers. Try to make it as big as I can. Cool. Uh, what you can see there, so we have um, two pods, pod A, pod B. Uh, and in front of each container, we notice that we have um, an envoy, right? So we have service A and service B. So the envoy is sitting in front of it. Um, and it's handling things like mutual TLS between services. Um, it's doing things like logging, right? So we have the ability to see kind of all the IO coming in and out. And, and then it talks back to, uh, there's a couple different services Istio has, um, Mixer, there's a lot. And, but what it ends up doing is gives you the ability to kind of aggregate all this stuff, and then you can use different dashboards like Grafana uh, to visualize and kind of understand what's happening in your environment. Uh, unlike service meshes, um, I think they do add a, a layer of complexity of their own. 
Um, especially things like Istio, they're non-trivial in some ways. There's, uh, there's some more in it, but there's some kind of hidden dragons and implementations. Um, they introduce a lot of new resource types. Um, there is some overhead to management, um, things like that. But it's, it's a trade-off, right? Because there's things that now we suddenly have magic security controls that we don't have to worry about as we deploy new applications. So automated injection is one of those important things, right? Anytime we deploy an application, we want to make sure it has a sidecar in front of it, right? So we don't want to get in the habit of like deploying applications without sidecars. Um, but if you take a look at how things like you know, Istio and Envoy work um, with Kubernetes and integrations, they do give you the ability um, to inject a sidecar when we, when we spin up a new pod, right? So we have some assurance at that point that our pods have things like mutual TMS because who, who, who has TMS everywhere in their environment, including between all of their internal services, right? Like I know big and small organizations that have like plain text traffic passing somewhere, right? Uh, and this is one of those things, it's can you, do you do this at every single application and, and manage the key infrastructure yourself? Maybe not. Um, things you can also get from kind of running a service mesh, uh, you can push policy down, you can push configuration updates. So that sidecar that's running can also get updates to security policy, so you can run it in conjunction with the things you could do with a controller and an emission control. You can also um, push those policy updates in real time. Um, you can limit egress controls. Um, if you have a compromised service, uh, you can basically um, uh, get rid of all its keys and revoke those, and um, you're going to be limited in what that can actually access. Um, and you can manage all that through PKI, which is managed for you. Like I don't say manage PKI, I say let Istio manage it for you. Uh, but this is cool because I, I, I see this as an opportunity um, to get rid of things that we just we, we spend a lot of time, money, and we still get wrong. Secrets management is uh, another place that we uh, have to think. So we have first class APIs um, in most platforms now, but sometimes we don't use them. Or we use them and they still suck. So Docker, for example, on top there, if you were to do that and you run with dash E, uh, you're running environment variables, which means those are going to be available like a set command. Uh, they're going to be in different uh, logs and dashboards, right? So this is not the greatest way to distribute credentials. Uh, Docker has a secrets management API, um, and you can do Docker secret create. What ends up happening is people will put those secrets then in shell scripts, they'll put them in other files that go into like GitHub and all these other places, and they're on developer laptops. And so um, you find that you get a little bit better at it, but you just kind of kick that problem somewhere else. And Kubernetes does have a first class um, secrets management API, and I know like Mesos Marathon, they support secrets management as well. Docker Swarm, pick your, pick your orchestration tool. Um, but we still have some problems there because what we end up finding is that we still store those in plain text. So remember we talked about that etcd that people put on the network with no authentication and uh, full network access, right? Well, everything's stored plain text credential-wise there. So all your application secrets are stored base64 inside of um, an etcd key value store. So we can encrypt them. Um, and as of like Kubernetes 1.7, uh, they gave you the ability to do secrets encryption at rest. Um, Docker Swarm supports secrets encryption at rest, and there's similarities in all the approaches, but the downside there is you still need um, a symmetric key to do that, and you have to basically spin that up with that, and then you have to figure out how to get rid of that key at some point. So it's maybe a little bit better, but it still um, has implementation-related issues that are going to happen. Um, and as I mentioned, what people end up doing is they will put secrets in uh, config files, right? They'll put them in, pick, pick a place the config file is going to end up at, right? Um, so we can integrate with things like key management solutions, and the, the integration is getting better. Um, so they're not in this slide um, because I haven't played with it that much, but um, Vault has the, um, does anybody mess with like Vault's um, uh, auto unsealing functionality and integration with like key management? Uh, that's, I think, the way to go, to be perfectly honest. Like, nobody has any business managing secrets. Um, key management solutions combined with things like Vault, right? And if that's like a first class integration, you can rotate secrets, um, keep them away from people's prying eyes. Um, basically, the kind of concept here is that if you're using something like Vault, and again, you could work with, you know, I know there's tools like CyberArk, and if you pay for something, great. Uh, but essentially, what we end up doing at that point is we don't actually store the secret. Um, in the kind of orchestration environment, but we need a way to authenticate to um, something like Vault or wherever we store those secrets. So we end up using service account tokens. So remember when I also talked about the fact that we want to create accounts that use different service account tokens? So all these things kind of start to follow us as these services need to do things, right? So now we need to access re uh, secrets 
So imagine we have you know, gotten those things uh, out of our cluster and we put them inside a vault, but we're still sharing service counts, right? Well, then it's kind of trivial at that point to be able to steal that service count token um, because you're running as the same account and impersonate uh, within vault, right? So we've gotten maybe a little bit better at that point. Uh, so all these things, right? Authentication, how do we create our accounts? As you see, these things follow us as our, as our application and, and our architectures evolve. And here's an example if you were gonna just like script that out and you, you see a lot of things that run curl and uh, I actually picked that one verbatim uh, and as you can see, they do it over HTTP, which is fantastic. And, um, but essentially what we end up doing is we have the ability to do some calls before the container actually starts up. So we end up calling out um, and we use a service count token, unlock, call out to vault, get those credentials, and then we mount those for the container when the actual container itself's life cycle starts up. So the container itself doesn't know any better how we got the secret, where it got it from. It just knows that when the container starts, the secret's ready for it to use within your application. And then whatever you do with the secret from there um, at runtime is up to you, right? I know people that they'll you know, run a script to kind of kill the container secret and make sure, um, but it's still good at some point. Cool, that's my presentation, folks. So um, things I kind of wanted you to think about today are just thinking about the patterns. And what we end up seeing across cloud native systems is that a lot of the same patterns are codified and a lot of the tools we're picking and pulling off the shelf are adopting a lot of the same patterns. So things like service mesh you're gonna hear a lot about, using things like sidecars you're only gonna hear more about. Um, and some of the kind of the core things like reconcilers, um, we didn't talk a lot today about circuit breaking, but circuit breaking is a big thing you'll, you'll, you'll kind of deal with a lot. And these are all the core patterns to kind of understand as you build and especially secure your systems. Uh, one of the things that I've seen is that people's environments are very kind of codified around um, their workflows, kind of business functions, right? Um, so things like that, right? You know. Uh, Related systems are, are maybe going to related. Uh, so you have to think about how does your organization work and how does that actually translate to um, a software stack. And last but not least, apply security controls at the layers they make the most sense at. Some things make the most sense in your application. Some things make sense in a Docker file. Some things make sense to do with Kubernetes. Some things make sense just let AWS worry about, right? Um, so just kind of always focus on where does it make the most sense. And where do you get the most bang for your buck and the least is going to go wrong with implementing those security controls? Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, there's my contact info. Uh, any questions before we jump out of here? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned or you compared and contrasted sidecars to service mesh pattern. And I just wanted to follow up to see how you might contrast those two. So service sure. mesh, like individual little features that you get that will start around, or how would you contrast mm -hmm. So his question was, what's the difference between essentially a, a or relation between a, contain, um, a sidecar and a service mesh? So um, a sidecar just basically refers to the fact that you're going to deploy a container alongside another the container uh, that's going to offload some functionality, right? So they're going to have some access to shared resources, um, network namespaces, and stuff like that. Um, but sidecars need some way to manage those, right? And they need some way to communicate with each other and have some centralized way to manage them with policies. So that's where service mesh comes in because inside of that service mesh, what we end up having is all those uh, sidecars can communicate uh, back to the mothership as well with each other, right? And they can get information. So if we run sidecars in a distributed way, then we want to run those within the service mesh. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the answer to how do you know what your state is? Yeah, it means, I mean, you need obviously telemetry. You need understanding obviously of, you know, what's happening between environments as things are being promoted, right? Um, and unfortunately, there's not like one layer that that's all going to happen at, right, in my opinion. So, um, I mean, obviously one of the things that helps with that is base image management. Uh, so, you know, organizations that have, here's the base images you're going to extend from. And we at least know these base images have support for things like seccom being built in. Um, so, I mean, I've seen that handled through image management. Um, just basically being like, you know, here's our internal, right, you can't basically call out to like Docker Hub. You can only get from like... But at the same time, you know, you can, but we can call those, but we're going to pull those things in. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's unfortunately a, a, a multiple layers probably at this point, right? So a lot of unsolved problems. Um, so in terms of sharing service account, uh, there's, there's some things you have to accept that, that there's, there's some consequences, right? There's uh, some things that are potentially going to be, you know, torn down in terms of, uh, you know, access to namespaces, right? Because you're going to be, you know, same user inside of some of those things. Uh, so there's some of those things that are kind of, so um, I believe uh, at some point you'll be able, for example, inside of a pod to be able to run with different accounts. 
right? As opposed to like if you run everything inside of a pod now, you have to run with the same service count. Um, at some point, you have the ability to do both, right? But in terms of managing, in terms of, so like if you look at different distributions like OpenShift, for example, they solve that problem to a degree, right? Because you'll run with different users when you actually run. Um, yeah, so I guess the short answer to that is there are some ways you can do that, and different distributions handle it differently. But yeah, stock Kubernetes, there's, there's yeah, a little different. Uh, I think I'm probably out of time, so thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>